we start repeating that. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. Uh, we have to change out the battery. So we were talking about the Blair Hotel down in Pittsburgh, which was at one time an actual hotel. That's true. And I remember eating downstairs uh, in the... Probably 1946, Ms. Wicker run a restaurant there, and we'd been over to uh, Duke uh, to see the Duke Chapel and the, and all the gardens with uh, three people from California that were out here, and my mom and my aunt went with them over there, and we made a tour. A, a Duke Chapel in the garden, and then we come back and ate supper at the uh, Blair Hotel where Ms. Wicker run. And so the woven label mill was the most important part of Pittsburgh, no doubt, for years. That Mr. Ralph Riddle was the superintendent, and he hired all the good people around Hank Chapel and everywhere to work there. And some of the people down here on the Pea Ridge Road worked there their whole career. So it was a place, I think, where people enjoyed the fellowship with each other, and it was the biggest woven label mill in the world for years. How many folks were employed there? I think it's somewhere around 250 people or more all the time. Yeah. Now, what was Pittsburgh like when you were growing up? The town, it's the downtown area, the courthouse area, what was that like? I went to Pittsburgh when I was in school at Moncure. They bust us up there on the school bus to be there when President Franklin D. Roosevelt came through from Pinehurst. He come in on the train and then they, uh, they escorted him up to Pittsburgh and I saw a young lady gave him some flowers and I was sitting upstairs in a window and uh, every kid in Chatham County was almost bust into Pittsburgh for that and it was raining real hard that day. And then President Roosevelt went on over to Chapel Hill. That's where he was going to go probably for a major speech or something. And I, I didn't know what exactly why, but I know he was in North Carolina. And it, and it was the biggest thing that would happen in the county for during my young years when I was down. I was small, but... Uh, my brother and sister, we all went on the school bus to Pittsburgh. And then Pittsburgh was isolated from us pretty much. Uh, Moncure Pittsburgh Road was a dirt road till maybe 1950 something, I'm not sure. It was a dirt road and the train went up from Moncure to Pittsburgh every day. It went up forward and come back backwards. and. Uh, I believe it crossed the highway two different spots going to Pittsburgh. Anyway, when we were farming, we would hear that train blow at about 11.30 every day. And that was our, instead of the dinner bell, it was the train whistle that we heard. And we knew it was getting by time we could go home and eat some dinner. So that was took the place of the bell for us. But anyway, Moncure Pittsburgh had a Ramsey taxi service and he went down to Moncure twice a day on a taxi to pick up the mail at Moncure and carry it back to Pittsburgh with a taxi and you could get a ride with Mr. Ramsey in his taxi to go to Pittsburgh if he, he wanted to and he probably couldn't care but about three or four people. But anyway, you could go to Pittsburgh on Ramsey's tax and get back to Montreal. Uh He did that for years. And, uh, so Pittsburgh was a small place. Some Sundays, we guys, when we were growing up, would uh, get on our bicycle and ride to Pittsburgh from here, which was about 12 miles. And we go through the old wooden covered bridge on uh, by Hank's Chapel Church, and we get to Pittsburgh, and Mr. Cecil Williams had a feeding station there, the SO station, and it was open on Sunday, and you could get a Pepsi Cola and something to eat, and get enough strength to ride the bicycle back home. And so the next day, 
on Monday, your parents knew that you probably had wore yourself out a little bit on Sunday doing that ride. Well, we did that quite a few times and it was fun. My kids didn't have a lot to do back then other than congregate together and enjoy fellowship. You know, even what we call the con corn cob war down at the old cotton gin, kids would try to knock each other down with a corn cob. And I don't remember anybody's eye being put out, but it's a miracle they didn't because they popped you upside the head doing a war. We was having a war over the corn cobs. So wait a minute, do you use the corn cobs as swords? Or are you Doing just throwing them throw, at each other? Try to hit somebody with them. You'd have four people on each side and have who got hit the most. <laughs> that was some game, you know. It's kind of like doing a, maybe jumping a branch or something like that. <laughs> now, what was Bynum like? I mean, that was a company town. You had Bynum had the rapid, okay, you go. I was going to say, it was, it was a company town, you had the mill, and so what was... It was, was a cotton mill owned by Mr. London, and uh, John London owned the bank, he owned the cotton mill, I guess he built the dam there for the power for the mill, so Bynum was a cotton mill town that was kind of u unique to itself, and had the reputation of everybody kind of took care of each other if something was going on, so... I guess they had a few little fights around when Bynum uh, met around Pittsburgh or something. I don't know. I, I, I didn't ever, I didn't ever go to Bynum like that much. I, uh, I, my first cousin was a secretary to Mr. London, but her her office was there in Pittsburgh. I guess it was in what was the old bank now. Uh, I guess that's a BB and T. No. I don't, I don't even know what the name of the bank is anymore. It used to be the Bank of Pittsburgh. It's right there, there on the corner. On the corner. Yep. And I'm not sure what it is. It's either. been bought by, two of the, by a couple of different banking companies. But anyway, they had, and then they got the right to build a bank in Moncure, and now that's closed, but it operated for several years, which was a blessing to people around this community here to have a bank close by. So now Moncure doesn't have much really going for it in the way of uh, of any kind of industry at all. It used to be built around the planer and lumber operations. And so it's really, it was a beautiful little village when I went to school there. They had what they call downtown Moncure and they, you know, in the depot down there bringing in uh, cars for the Studebaker place. So it was that really active little village and everybody had a lot of pride in it. Now Moncure has seen some uh, desecration of its looks right now, so hopefully it'll be revived in the future to look better. Uh, but anyway, I enjoyed being at Moncure School. I had a lot of good memories there. Ended up being on the local school board and we kid about it sometimes. I, signed one of my neighbor's diploma here when he graduated, so he's got a little diploma there. With me. Every little area had a school board for each little individual school. And then now we're consolidated, and then all you have is a county school board, really. So, used to be a lot of little school boards scattered all over the county, and they, that made a tighter group for schools to have that, that way. You were appointed by somebody, though, to be on the school board. And you know, another thing, I don't, I don't know anybody think I'm bragging, but I spent a lot of years with North Carolina Farm Bureau and Chatham County Farm Bureau. I was president of Chatham County for 26 years, which, which was what, to me, was one of the greatest honors that this county has ever given me with the privilege of being Chatham County Farm Bureau for 26 years and see it start from almost nothing to where it is today, a very active place that I feel, still feel proud of because it's in charge of what Charles Ludlow is in charge of it, a lot of people that I know. And then I got on the state Farm Bureau board in Raleigh for a few years and the president 
of uh, North Carolina Farm Bureau appointing me to represent agriculture in the vocational education and applied technology panel that was a sound was the Perkins Act where we uh, were in charge of delegating the funds to different things while I was on the board and and I try to be humble about it but Governor Martin saw uh, felt the importance justified making me um, uh, justified and give me the honor to be a uh, my mind slipping on me so I have to forget it for a minute. Governor Martin was going to give you some type of... He uh, made me a uh, why you know, I, I'll just have to go to something else for me right. because I've skipped it. I, uh, now I saw a picture. I'm, I'm a uh, sitting there on the board. Okay. Go I was gonna say I saw a picture, an old picture of you with someone else um, doing a presentation. I guess at over in Siler City. Was that what, what? What were your responsibilities on the Farm Bureau? Oh, uh, I had the uh, I had the ability to hire the agent for the Farm Bureau and I, find, I hired his secretaries to work there and uh, we were uh, uh, actually Chatham County Farm Bureau is, is an in, independent part of all 100 counties have a central office like that so uh, that was a, a big and I served on what you call the ASC board for a long time agricultural stabilization board which uh, represented farmers in Chatham County. Of course that's a part of the uh, you, you agriculture, you Federal Department of Agriculture. And so uh, I had that privilege here but when I ran for office in the county as a county commission I had to give that up. They, they won't allow you to run for public office and be in, on the agricultural state books station board and they changed the name of it to FSA Farm Service Agency since I was on. And, uh, I, I, Governor Martin gave me the the uh, honor of having an order the long league pine. Okay, that's right. That's what I was trying to, it, but it escaped me. But anyway, that to me is one of the, the uh, whether I deserve it or not, it's one of the greatest privileges that I've been able to have in my life, I think, was that. Because it's such a unique honor to be given that award. And uh, you join the likes of a lot of people that have been awarded that. And a lot of people that probably sh should have been awarded in preference of me getting it, but I'm very thankful for it. And, uh, it makes me very humble to know that the governor did that for me and for I don't know any any other people, but the likes of Michael Jordan or somebody like that. Now you were uh, a member of the Economic Development Committee of Chatham County, and there were a couple other. Yeah, I stayed on it several years. Ch there were other kind of Chatham County committees and and, uh, and organizations you belong belong to. Planning board, right? Uh, uh, can you give us a little bit of history of that leading up to why you decided to, to run for office? I always had a feeling that I wanted to be uh, involved in what happened in the county. You know, it was I could see where I felt like some things could be improved on what was happening. I felt like I felt like if I run, I would be independent and I wouldn't be beholden. I didn't think I would be beholden to any certain thing that I could have the freedom to express my feelings and do what I thought was right. That's the reason I wanted to run. I, I wouldn't run uh, for any one person thinking they could get me to do what they wanted me to. Of course, I wasn't successful. But uh, I still enjoyed doing that. I got to see a lot of people. Certainly went all over the county a lot of times and had a lot of good people in the western part of the county that I met in the agricultural community especially. So uh, uh, that was, I enjoyed running and uh, 
even in defeat, I felt like maybe I accomplished something for future people to run. And so now we're seeing, we've seen some fruits of uh, having a diversified group of people running the county, and I think it's for the better that we have. At one point, it was just total control for years by one one faction of this county, and I won't call the name, but uh, really we were we wanted the control of almost just one family telling, I thought, three commissions what they ought to do. And so that, that's not the way I felt like things ought to be done. Right. Uh, let's backtrack or actually kind of move. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you met Miss Barbara and and, and tell well, us about you, a little bit about your your, your kids, your, your 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 family. Well, um, like I said, I was divorced after 21 years of marriage. I stayed unmarried for 14 years till I thought all the kids were. I had I got them grown and on their own and. Uh, so uh, I joke about it, but I sold tobacco with uh, Barb's sister, who was one of the only women that owned the warehouse in North Carolina, which I think is a great honor for her. She owned a fake cotton camera and owned a warehouse for years, and she was successful at it. And I was selling tobacco with her. We were growing about 40, 50 acres of tobacco. We, actually ended up with uh, mechanizi mechanization of having a tobacco harvest and bulk barns, which are all gone now. But uh, anyway, I carried a load of tobacco down to Sanford and put it on the floor probably one day. And then the next day I had to go back to watch the sale. And uh, I'd known a sister for Barbara a long time, but she was so much younger than I was that uh, she'd gone to Virginia and taught school there and had a, a career in Virginia and then her marriage went bad and so she was back in uh, car rent. And when I get to my pile of tobacco, they had a sister there looked like to me dressed up pretty good, kind of sitting on a pile of that tobacco there. You know, I said, what's going on here? I don't know, they don't, mm, something different. So were they setting a trap for you? Uh, mm, I don't know why they would, a common guy like me. I've never understood why in the world they were trying to capture an old guy like me. She's, I'm 14 years older than she is, but I mean, I'm in the good prime of life then. Right. But I knew I would reach this peak a lot quicker than she would. Right. So. Yeah, they kind of set the trap for me, and uh, first thing you know, I'm down to, well, here's your gunner now. Well, not sure, I've still got her. <laughs> <laughs> She's coming in here on her car. Anyway, she, uh, we went to the flame to eat one night. That was right soon. Well, I mean, I'm beginning to look at her, boy. I like her looks. I mean, my eyes are pretty good. And I'd watched her on TV when she was younger singing and doing on what you call the Thornton Show on Channel 11 uh, over at Durham. And uh, I had my own family up on the hill then, and I was watching her every Saturday night singing because uh, I knew the family, really. Right. And they were down the car rent 10 miles away from here, and I knew all about them. And uh, then uh, we went to the flame down in Sanford to eat a little bite of food. We, I think we ordered a steak. I'm sure I couldn't afford it for them, but I'm sure we ordered it, probably the best one on the menu. And they come out with some stale crackers. And I said, you know, if this woman, if this woman don't gripe about doing stale crackers, I believe she's going to be okay. So she ate them old crackers that had been at the flame for about a year. And I ate mine, and she didn't say nothing about it. They were bad. I said, man, I like women like that. They don't gripe and grumble about everything. So from there in, we got to seeing each other more and more, and she actually helped me farm one summer there. By the time we were getting ready to get married, 
we asked Perry Harrison to help us get a, get a job in the county, but we didn't do too good. I think they researched and find out. She went to Campbell College and registered as a Republican. That was the end of her here in Chatham County. And Perry never could look at me good in the eye. I'm sorry to say this, but it's the truth. Because I wrote him a letter, I said, would you please help Barb get a job here in the county if you have an opening somewhere. But Joe Burke gave a job, recommended her for a job over at Silk Hope, which she filled over there for a few months till she was able to run into the right situation here at Deep River in Lee County. Right. And she had a real good career there in Lee County, thanks to a friend of mine, who was a principal over there at another school, but had a little, you know, a little connection up, his, up the line. And then Barb got down and she taught school for, there for 20 some years. And I said, I said, Barb, you gotta quit. She's having problems with her heart. I said, there's no reason to die at Deep River School because I need you. Right. So. <laughs> Anyway, she uh, wound up her career after having the paddles put to an ambulance one day going to the hospital down there. And that yeah, she had up. a problem at the school and they had to take her to the hospital? Oh yeah, yeah, she pays out that paddle in the, uh, in the ambulance to bring her heart back. I mean, you know, it was serious. I said, quit school now, because I won't have nobody to, do, to take care of me if, you, if something happens. So she quit. And, uh, but she had the privilege of... That was pretty selfless of you there. Wor worried more about her than about you, huh? Yeah, because she was making more money probably <laughs> than I was, even though I had a little mobile home park down here, and I developed a little land like Jordan Woods. I don't know you know where that's at. Yes, not. I do. But I did that in conjunction with Earl Thomas, and uh, anyway, we did a few things around together. But anyway, i got to get back to bar. Let's see. Barb, uh, she she got paddled, and you said Barb, she's got to quit. Yeah, and so, but during the meantime, Barb's principal was Mr. Gary Moore, and he's a Reverend Gary Moore, but he had kind of got out of the preaching business and was principal of Deep River School. So Barb knew New Eden Church right here at the house was looking a preacher. So she said, Gary. You need to go up to New Elam Church and see if you can't take that job being a preacher at New Elam Church. And you know he got that thing and he preached that for 26 years and he just now gave it up. His health began to deteriorate a little bit. And he he's had that church ever since that I look at every time I look out the window that way. And he's helped, he met the church has grown and helped the neighborhood and Bob was the reason that he got pointed this way, and I'm thankful for all of that. So, there we go. That's, I don't know where she's going now, but... She's probably staying cool. Uh, let me ask you this question, if you don't mind answering this. I can answer this. How, how, how important has faith been in your in your life, and in, 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 in the, just the whole McCoy, your folks' life, your life, and your kids' lives? That's, that's all I, that's That's everything that we are is our faith. You know, we had instilled in us as kids that uh, nothing beats being in tune with Jesus Christ our Savior. Trying to do the best we can by our fellow man. And that was instilled in us in a, in a strong way of mom and dad and our grandparents. And uh, it, we just never could, it's always been there. And, uh, we are the kind of people that want to be helpful to others in front of ourselves if we can. That's just the way I feel about life. And so this little church right here when we lived down the river we didn't have a car. So we were members of Ebenezer but uh, we couldn't get up there for several years. So we went to church seven years right down here at New Eden Church and we walked from the river up there. We were there every Sunday. I don't know how we did it, but we never missed because we wanted to go see people. Because it wasn't hard in the car. Sometimes we'd get a ride back home down. We were, we lived six tenths of a mile off the road, so uh, we'd get a ride sometimes back down the road to the house, but most of the time we had to walk both ways. And uh, I remember one 
son and my dad, I think, lost his temper a little bit. He was coming up the road with a new steer sucker pants on and the best shirt he had, a regular guy hit a mud hole and uh, knocked water all over and he didn't look too good when he got to the church. And I think he might have lost a little bit of religion that morning, but he got it back. <laughs> Mom probably told him, oh, look, Charlie, a good lick of mud upside your head probably get you. See, he, he would be one of these that set out doors a little while church had already started talking about dogs and stuff, and he'd get in the church about five minutes late. Of course, he, back then in the church here when I was growing up, the women sat on one side and the men on the other. They did. If a man sat with his wife, he was a he was a let's see, he was a sissy. People called it, and really it was good, but we didn't know it at the time. The man is close to his wife. He wants to be a pair of people that are in tune with each other, trying to help people. But we didn't know that, so we go. Men went this side, women that side, and finally that barrier went down. But that's just the way it was, and I don't want it that way. Well, didn't think much about it. And some of the people that were superintendents in that church made a difference in my life. You know, I remember vividly all of those older men that taught to Sunday school. They actually knew about preachers, you know, so. 1945, Mr. Lee Johnson was preaching here at New Elam Church. He had one arm. He come here to this house at Dunham with us. That was in 1945. And it started raining that day, and it rained a week. And that's the, that's the reason that, the, that's what started the new uh, effort to build Jordan Dam. In 1945, it rained a week. It got over every road around here. You couldn't go nowhere. So it got over everything down around the, uh, toward the power plant. They were stranded out there. The cars were all under water. So was water just sitting here because it, it had no place to it go? It was or? sitting here in this dish pan. Couldn't go nowhere. And it went over the old number one bridge, almost over the railroad bridge. So it just covered everything. And uh, people were stranded down at the power plant except to go in on the railroad. You know, they had a big wall around there. I don't, it didn't breach that. But uh, that's what started the effort. To, and, it, they, and of course, it succeeded in catching on to the need for something because Fed was inundated. Everywhere was inundated. It was just, it was massive. Lake people paddled the uh, boats up and down the highway. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So was it? It wasn't a storm or anything. It was just a week's worth of heavy rain. It just sat here and rained and rained and rained. It wasn't any wind or anything. You just sat here and just kept dumping out water. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know. I don't even believe we had any kind of a breeze. We just uh, one of those things that we they say happens once in maybe every hundred years. So if we get it again, it would put the dam to the test to where it would have, the water would have to go around the spillway here, which is very wide. But so far, I don't think any water has ever gone around the spillway since they built it. Right. So it's done what it's supposed to do about protecting everything down Cape Fear River. So, it, you know, it's really, it's really been a life safe. Ain't no doubt about it. So, and I've seen it all. I mean, I've felt it, I've seen it, I've seen the pain and the anguish that caused some people, and I've seen the joy that some people have enjoyed by having it, like uh, my cousin that runs the Wilsonville store, it's been a, it's been a boon to him there at that store, because it just brings in thousands of people. And he enjoys sitting there in the corner seeing people. Uh, his wife's been to see 12 years, and has, that's what he looks forward to, is going over there to the store. And uh, he gets to see people, and he enjoys that. He's a people person. Uh, and I go up there and sit in that store sometimes, and uh, I 
them, I tell them I'm on the board of directors and that they're <laughs> just piling up all of my retirement over there somewhere. And I told John Office, I said, when in the world am I going to be able to get what y'all owe me? And he said, well, you've not been here quite long enough yet. So, and half of the board members that was on the board with me now are dead. So I, I'm about the only one left. This, so I'm, I got a lot of power because I'm the only board member left. But it seemed like he don't care any benefits. Well, if somebody were to ask you, what, what's, what's? I mean, you, you're sharp as a tack, and and you, you seem to be in good health. And we, we just talked about, you know, keeping an eye on, on those spots that show up every once in a while on on your, on your face or on your hands and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. But. Yeah. What do you count your good health and, and, and your sharp brain to? I mean, is there some secret, uh, is, is it a combination of tobacco and corn, or is it just... I didn't smoke. There you go, okay. <laughs> I didn't smoke, and uh, now I have to attribute my good health is to doctors and drugstores. Because if I didn't have the... Uh, cardiologists, the uh, cancer uh, surgeons, and the ability to do things that you couldn't imagine being done when I was a kid, I wouldn't be here. You know what it is, I tell some of them, some of us folks are living too long. If you want to take care of the situation like it used to be, everybody died early. Now we're living longer because we have such tremendous advances in uh, medical care and, and it's a joy to be cared for and I, I, I'm, I'm going to pitch a, something for a drugstore. See I love Pittsburgh discount drugstore. Uh, Greg Vasty and I, I had kidded with him ever since he was there. He and Trey Waters and of course he's now it's his wife's in there, Jennifer, and uh, three or four other ladies. And they, I drive up with a Duke thing on front of my car, and they just give me a fit about that. But it's in a joking way, because I got, I have to mention this. I've got a step-granddaughter that got a scholarship to Duke that pays half of all her bills. And, and we just couldn't be more happy than that because her mom and daddy in some way everybody's going to finish paying the rest one way or the other but she still works and makes the money on the side so she's just got to be able to pursue her her education to work wherever it's going to lead to in medical science but I mean she's, a, she's just been a fantastic kid she, I love her to death I'm, I'm real close to her. My children, after the uh, divorce, it made it harder for me to really stay connected to them the way I would have loved to, and it's been hard for her. I'm getting into personal a little bit, but it's been hard. Usually when you have second marriages, it brings on situations that normal marriages never have to face. Let's just leave it there. And uh, we face it pretty good. We get along. Everything's going to be okay. My mental capacity you ask about, yep. I don't know how sharp it is. You tell me. Well, you remember dates and years a whole lot better than some of the dates and years I, I remember. I once forgot that our, our wedding anniversary was October 6th. I thought it was October 8th. You think I'm ever going to forget that again? I did no. the, I've done the same thing with Bob. <laughs> when I got it. She was she born January uh, 8, 1943. Well, uh, I brought home roses too quick one time, and she knew that I'd screwed up, didn't say much. But, I mean, I've been known to miss those, those birthdays. I mean, well, it, well, I, I, well, I, my folks didn't do a lot over birthdays. When I grew up, they won't like some of the folks that really, and I, hey, I, I appreciate some family being, being so 
do so many thoughtful things for birthdays and kids. Barb thinks more about it than I do, I guess. But I didn't grow up where we did a lot of fanfare when like I had a birthday and my brother and sister, we, uh, I guess it wasn't a whole lot of things you could do. Uh, one day, this was a good thing happened, uh, <laughs> down on the Bland place where I got my formative years and loved every minute of it. Uh, my sister, we had to walk to the school bus. It was six tenths of a mile, and me and my brother had got over there, and my sister was humping it on up the road pretty good, pretty good, I guess. But we told the driver she wasn't going. And what saved the day, she went back home, and you know that was one mad girl. Uh huh. She found a horse in the branch. <laughs> he fell in the branch, and it was gold. So she saved the horse's life. Life, so we didn't have a bad deal when we got home because Hazel, and my sister, had saved the horse's life probably because it was cold. So they had to take the other big old mule down there.